Yeah, thanks a lot for the nice introduction, Katz, and thanks for uh, inviting me, and uh, thanks everyone for staying awake. It's just 15 more minutes for today to conclude. Okay, so let me talk about uh, uh, the publicly verifiable VSS and DKG from class groups. So, you know, threshold crypto, I guess, has been uh, talked about today about like nth time. So here is like a, uh, n plus one time, like some motivation for threshold crypto and blockchain. We know that threshold signatures are pretty important, uh, uh, like for signing by validators as Ethereum. Uh, so at Supra, actually, we have a threshold uh, version of VRF and uh, uh, sort of uh, kind of based on uh, threshold BLS signatures. Um, so that's sort of the fundamental motivation of designing, sort of exploring new DKG protocols. Uh, threshold crypto has been al also explored in other kind of setting, like uh, for uh, preventing front running by shutter network, and there are many more other applications. So I'd like to just uh, give this perspective of threshold crypto from, uh, as a special case of MPC. Uh, so it it's can be thought of a sort of a, a keyed function that has a secret key that's been uh, distributed and computing uh, on a public input. Right. So here are the features, I guess, sort of uh, kind of people already know. But uh, the first step of threshold crypto is to do a DKG, and uh, that means a distributed key generation. And the idea is to do sort of a reusable pre-processing phase that distributes shares of a secret key and generates a corresponding public key. Right. So I want to stress on this factor of reusable phase that you know standard MPC pre-processing is typically not reusable. They are consumable. I think has been already explored in other setting. But for threshold crypto, you can do this DKG, which can be uh, used unlimited number of times. So we have T out of in access structure. Uh, any T1 parties can execute. Up to T corruptions are tolerated. You know, for liveness guarantee, we would assume an honest majority. That is, N is greater than or equal to 2T plus 1. And today's focus will be on the first uh, item, that is distributed key generation for keys of this particular form. So the secret key is a field element, uh, and the public key is a basically a group element of G to the SK, where G is a cyclic group of prime order. Right? So we are just focusing on this particular case. And by distributed key generation, uh, we mean to design a protocol that parties don't have input. There is no input to this particular protocol. And at the end, each parties receive a T and share of the secret key. That is, you know, parties, party I will get SKI and so on. And at the same time, everyone obtains the public key with the following form that G to the SK, right? So that's the overall uh, setup. So we want to design a protocol for this. So verifiable secret sharing can be a fundamental building block for uh, this type of DKG I'm going to describe. Uh, so what is verifiable secret sharing? So it's a fundamental building block where we can assume there is a dealer uh, and there are n recipients. And we are in the threshold setting of honest majority and we assume a broadcast channel. So that's the overall setting. So dealer has an input. Uh, that is S, and after the execution of the protocol, each party uh, RI, each recipient RI will get uh, their uh, values SI, right? So it's a TN sharing of S. It's kind of almost like DKG, but the problem is that dealer has the knowledge of the secret, right? So we'll go from here to build, build on to DKG, but this is a very fundamental building block. So reconstruction is basically pretty simple that any T plus one, if there is a reconstruction after all, they can broadcast to reconstruct um, the secret and they only accept if it matches with the public key. Right, so what are the guarantees of VSS? You know, so standard secret sharing guarantees, everyone knows that, you know, doesn't have to be verifiable that as long as up to T parties are corrupt, then the secret is hidden, very standard. Uniqueness or some sort of verifiability guarantee is basically if the dealer is corrupt, by no means dealer can make two different sets to reconstruct two, two different secrets, right? So uh, there is an uniqueness. A so dealer would be always committing to a particular unique S value, right? So that's sort of the uniqueness guarantee. And these two properties has been have been basically captured in the literature from all along. There is another property I think briefly mentioned in, uh, uh, in, in, in a talk that uh, public verifiability, that means that anyone 
may be even outside the system, may, may not be the dealer or the recipients can verify the correctness of the dealing, uh, as long as the corruption threshold is below T, right? So up to these properties, uh, uh, they, they were already explored and uh, we identified it can be strengthened the public verifiability, it can hold even when all recipients are corrupt, right? So this is a new property that we identified. It has been already sort of uh, informally uh, mentioned in previous works, but we try to sort of formalize it in our work. So a little bit more on this strong public verifiability property. That's saying that you know we are in the setting where the, there are more corruptions than the corruption threshold. That means the privacy is already gone. So there is sort of no guarantee of privacy. So what's what's it's basically guaranteeing after all? Yet there is a certain amount of certain kind of correctness guarantee that, that we sort of expect, right? And uh, this can be demonstrated by this particular attack that uh, I call snubbing honest dealer attack. So think about an honest dealer executes uh, and after that, you know, there, are the, uh, there is no guarantee there is the corruption is below the threshold, right? So in that sense, there is no way the honest dealer can prove to anyone that the execution is actually somewhat like correct or something, right? In particular, if all the recipients are corrupt, then later ca they can just reconstruct to something like, you know, an error. And that means that the honest dealer can decry but cannot really prove to anyone outside the system that the dealing was correct. So in particular, uh, in voting protocols, this can be really bad that honest voters' vote may not be counted after all, right? So in this situation, actually, there's a clear difference that if there is a guarantee up to, like there is no guarantee that uh, until uh, that there is a corruption uh, within T, uh, then honest dealer cannot really prove to anyone else outside the system that the execution is correct, right? So with strong public verifiability, of course, this can be fixed. That honest dealer does not rely on the recipients to provide any sort of assistance in generating a proof. So let me now talk about the state of art VSS protocol. So most of the VSS protocol so far uh, are considered were interactive, that means dealer and recipients, they interact multiple times. You know, starting from this famous work by Feldman, you know, uh, a recent work by, uh, you know, Das and others, you know, they basically uh, considered this interactive VSS protocols. Uh, in particular, this recent work actually formalized the public verifiability, the weaker version. And the basic idea is, uh, nothing but each recipient sends a signed acknowledgement and finally everyone publishes a signature, right? So if there are enough signatures, then basically it can be proven to anyone else outside the system that it is publicly verifiable. But uh, th it requires that there are enough signatures. So, so basically it does not achieve strong public verifiability because uh, you know, the recipients may not just respond, right? So. It hard, so fundamentally it seems hard to achieve for interactive protocols. However, there are non-interactive VSS as well and uh, the overall sort of template of constructing non-interactive VSS is pretty simple that dealer has a secret, it secret shares and encrypts each secret share of the secret to the corresponding public key of the recipients and with that it attaches a non-interactive zero-knowledge proof of correct secret sharing. So now, this correct secret sharing basically, so the NISIC proof basically guarantees that uh, it can achieve public verifiability because it's not reliant on any response from recipients, right? So, you know, in this uh, non-interactive setting, there are a couple of works. Uh, uh, Gentry and others, they build a non-interactive VSS or publicly verifiable VSS, they call, uh, it's, uh, it's based on lattices. Uh, it's slightly more inefficient than the uh, growth work, uh, which is cyclic group based. Uh, however, both of these work rely on certain range proofs. That means you need to prove to the fact that you are encrypting something that falls onto like within such certain range. So class group based VSS actually exactly uh, uh, dispenses with this any kind of range proof and that significantly not only simplifies but also provides the most efficient 
uh, non-interactive VSS, which achieves strong public verifiability. So let's take a closer look at Growth21, because that's sort of the starting point of our work. So you know, that's probably the only technical slide I have. So just uh, briefly, you know, Growth21 basically relies on exponentiated Ilgamal ciphertext. And uh, if you recall, they, so I'm just uh, using the multiplicative group notations. They look like as follows that, you know, uh, they have this g to the r and then this pk to the r times g to the m, where m is in the exponent. And it's kind of important that we use this exponentiated version for additive homomorphism, and without additive homomorph homomorphism, the NISIC proof would not be as efficient. Now, the problem with this, this kind of uh, using Ilgamal, exponentiated Ilgamal, is that since discrete log is hard in this cyclic group, you can only encrypt smaller ciphertext, right? So Growth21 basically uses, uh, you know, to encrypt a 256 message, it uses like 16 chunks of 16-bit messages, and as long as you have 16-bit messages in the exponent, you can actually decrypt efficiently. However, this sort of incurs new overhead, because now one has to prove that this chunking has been done correctly, and whatever uh, like the encryption contains in the exponent is sufficiently small. So a version of range proof has been used. It's uh, also called proof of chunking in the paper. So let's look into the class group encryption. So class group encryption looks very similar to exponential El Gamal, except for the fact that now the message is encrypted message is in the exponent of a group, which is a subgroup of the you know, the overall composite order group, which is of unknown order. And uh, in that particular subgroup, the discrete log is easy. However, in the other subgroup, right, where, uh, which is generated by this element G, uh, the discrete log is still hard, which kind of provides a security. So we have now the efficiency, because now we can encrypt 256, uh, 256-bit messages in the exponent, However, we do not need to provide any proof of chunking on range or range proof. So it's kind of a win-win situation that we get that we have a very simple design because that's sort of any providing any range proof makes sort of things much more cumbersome than uh, the, without uh, uh, doing it in this way. And uh, at the same time, because we do not have to do this 16 times proof, you know, we get, you know, m the most efficient VSS that has strong public verifiability. So let me sh uh, show some comparison with uh, uh, Growth21 because that's sort of our baseline. It's a simplified version of Growth21 that we compared with, and we see that with increasing, uh, increasing number of clients, we actually even the difference gets like larger and larger, right? Even uh, for the total communication and, you know, the dealer time and receiver time, we are slightly worse than the other two things, but still we are doing much better than Growth21. Uh, for example, if we have 150 clients, we get about 5x less communication and 2.5x less time overall. So finally, I've talked about uh, non-interactive VSS protocols, but you know, what about DKG? Because that was sort of the starting point of our work. I mean, if you sort of think about it, it's not too hard to construct a DKG protocol from a non-interactive DKG from a non-interactive VSS. So let's just uh, see that with uh, uh, these three parties and threshold equal to one. So basically, every party can now act as a dealer so that now nobody actually knows the actual secret, which would be some of all these dealings, all these secrets. And they can do this non-interactive VSS. And after the VSS execution uh, concludes, now everyone has sort of the, their corresponding shares. For example, party one here has shares like B1, C1. Party two has A2, C2, and so on. And they can basically now locally sum to get the uh, uh, final share, right? So K is basically the secret, and uh, party one's share is basically K1, which is equal to A1 plus B1 plus C1, and so on. And the public key as well, because the VSS already gives you the uh, uh, every dealing in the exponent, everyone can basically multiply them and can get this public key G to the K, which is nothing but G to the A plus B plus C. Super simple, right? 
So now, uh, let me briefly talk about strong public verifiability in the DKG setting. We saw that in sort of VSS setting, it's uh, how it's sort of being important. You know, we have strong public verifiability in the VSS, and it kind of translates to a strong public verifiability in the DKG setting as well. Uh, however, we can sort of think about it, that what is actually it's the guarantee it's uh, providing, right? So it's basically providing that even if the secret is sort of lost and K has no privacy, that uh, uh, the secret that's been constructed has no privacy, the distribution of K and G to the K is somewhat correct. Correct means, I mean, the guarantee would be basically if there is at least one honest party and the output of this protocol would be something that is sort of, you know, the K is uniformly random and G to the K is sort of also like a correct uh, public key, right? So it's, uh, there is a caveat here that we are not, we can have like some sort of biasing attack, but we can fix that in, by some other means. But, you know, that's kind of uh, out of the scope for this talk. Uh, so now one can think about actually if the if we are doing DKG for let's say threshold signature, if the secret key is lost, that's basically kind of meaningless, right? So anyone can forge a signature and so on. However, in the distributed VRF setting, that's sort of our main motivating setting. We have these two, we, two properties. One is unpredictability, which is clearly lost now because now if K is sort of known, you can basically compute the uh, you know distributed VRF uh, on your own. However, we can still have this unbiasability property that means that the output of the VRF is some sort of correct and you know, it cannot be biased, like it does not contain like strings of zeros or something, right? So it gives you some sort of a best possible guarantee in that case even when you know, more than uh, tolerated corruption happens. There are some additional benefit I did not talk about in this uh, kind of applicable to all these uh, non-interactive uh, VSS and DKG setting that we get asynchronous network support for free and it becomes kind of uh, crucial in especially we are doing things in blockchain uh, and uh, we are exploring more potential benefit that you know so far we have been doing things uh, assuming that you know we are having a broadcast channel but uh, in the blockchain, you can think about that it's not a perfect broad broadcast channel because you know it takes a lot of time to sort of you know uh, finalize block and so on. So we are sort of transferring these uh, te techniques to a sort of imperfect broadcast channel. This is a work in progress, and uh, any kind of non-interactive setting is uh, you know much more suitable for this setting than uh, more interactive settings, right? Yeah, I'm like already there actually, <laughs> right on time, right? So. Summarizing, sort of, we propose a new uh, non-interactive VSS and non-interactive DKG scheme uh, for uh, this particular K and G to the K key generation. You know, we have not only the most uh, simple scheme uh, because we sort of got rid of any sort of range proof, we have the most efficient scheme uh, among all existing ones. So simplicity and efficiency we get at the same time. Uh, at the same time, we sort of formalize, you know, I mean, identify would not be like the absolutely correct term because it has been discussed uh, before, but we sort of formalize this new property that's called strong public verifiability, it gives you sort of the best possible guarantee even if there are sort of more than expected corruptions. And uh, we did sort of formal UC based analysis, uh, uh, in uh, formal security analysis in the UC model. Uh, a preliminary version is available uh, here if you can scan the QR code and uh, we are working on sort of finalizing all the details of the proofs and uh, we should be uploading a final version soon, maybe in a few weeks. Uh, so thank you for uh, staying awake and uh, thanks for inviting. Yeah, thanks.